If you knew without a shadow of a doubt that at 5 o'clock today, there was going to be a massive tornado hit your house. Would you do anything different when you got home? If you knew for a fact that an F4 tornado was going to come towards your house. I would venture to say you're going to do some things different. Knowing there is an urgency of preparation. I shudder to think what Colton would do. Back up everything and head, up, <laughs> head, head somewhere. the opposite direction. Okay. Colton is totally leaving <laughs> the area with his various video game consoles. <laughs> Which one would you take first? If you can only take one, they're, they're all special. All, all of Colt's video games or consoles are special. <laughs> I think we all have, let's just say the scenario though, is we have to stay there. What would we do in preparation? Although yours is still a valid response. Open everything to the basement. Open <laughs> to the basement. There's gonna be some things that you're definitely going to do and since you know the time, it's going to be 5 o'clock, you have some time to prepare and say, get a plan together. Maybe talk with your family about what you're going to do when the time comes, and who's going to do what, and who's going to get this, and where you're going to be, and all of this kind of a thing. We should look at our Christian experience in the same way. Because there is going to come a day where everything is going to change. Yeah. One thing that I liked about the movie watched on Friday night called A Week Away. One thing that one of the characters said in there is you never know when you're just a week away from some major change in your life. You never know if you're just five hours some major change in your life. It's a great sound on Sunday morning before the service when I hear our Dr. Mower preaching at us in our Sunday school and we're taking notes and I hear people scratching on their pads and we're answering questions and, we're, and I hear Connie in there doing her thing and I hear her saying this and saying that and I hear kids answering and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is awesome because we're creating a sense of urgency we are preparing, we are teaching, we are getting ready for something. This is not just playtime here for us. This is a serious matter. Because in effect, a tornado is coming in our lives. One of those tornadoes in your life is going to be the time when you're not here anymore. Now we all like to think that's going to be a long ways away, but nobody truly knows, do they? So there actually is an urgency all the time into learning what we need to learn about faith and what's coming. I've known several people in my life that I've known really well, good friends of mine, and then all of a sudden, they're gone, just like that. And I was like, wow. I sometimes say to myself, I wish I'd have, you know, kept thinking several times, call them up, go do something. Why didn't I do that? There was a sense of urgency I didn't even realize. I need to realize it more often. There is a sense of urgency in training our kids up in the way that they should go, as the Bible says. We're working right now on a very, very important overall theme for our Sunday mornings, and that is God's design for the family. In no greater time in my lifetime has a family ever been under such brutal, open, attack on families. So much so it's even glorified now in the media and in the world of this attack on the family and the family unit and what God has designed for our families to be. But we have to understand there is a sense of urgency in this battle because it will soon come to an end either for us individually or for the world as a whole in the second coming of Christ, and then it's too late. You must make a decision. So we've kind of talked about how important that is over the past couple of weeks. 
We talked about how you talk to your children about their faith, how you talk to them about Christ. We talked about the basics of what it means to be a Christian is that you believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was raised from the dead, made an atonement for our sins, and we live free. Those are the basics of the Christian faith, among some other things that we discussed. Now we have to talk about how to live that out on a daily basis. How do you live your life out on a daily basis? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to act? What are you supposed to say? And as Paul gave us a nice dirty list of what you're not supposed to say, I call that the dirty deeds list. Don't do these things, he says. And then he says, but there's hope. Do these things. Those are called the fruit of the Spirit. Now that's not to be confused with um, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, a person could have one or more spiritual gifts, such as teaching, preaching, edification, prophecy. That's listed in another place in the Bible. This is different. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. The fruit that you bear from the Holy Spirit should be these things. So in effect, we should have all of these things on our tree. Our tree needs to bear all of this fruit as a Christian. So what are those fruits again? This is uh, verse 22. Love, joy, patience. You all got patience? The first, first two are like, love, that's good. I love people, that's good. I got love. Joy, joy's pretty good. I got that one covered. It's kind of like, I'm pretty joyful sometimes. Yeah, that's good. I got joy. Patience. Man, why has that got to be in there? Patience. Everybody's always like, I'm working on that one. I'm working on the patience. Kindness. Some people can be a little kinder. Me too. My, why did I say that so mean? I could be a little kinder. Goodness. Faithfulness. Are you faithful to God? Or do you sometimes just kind of forget he even exists? Are you faithful to your spouse? Are you faithful to your boss? Are you faithful to your church? Oh, don't say that, Steve. Ouch. Are you faithful to your loved ones? Are you faithful to God? Gentleness. I know some people just have a spirit of gentleness. I didn't say they were weak. I said they had a spirit of gentleness. And I can see it in how they interact with other people. Self-control. Do we have to put that one in there too? I'd like to take out patience and self-control if we could. I'd like to scratch those out of the Bible right now. But we cannot. Because they apparently are very important. Self-control is very important. If you don't have self-control, then you're going to go back up into list number two of all the dirty deeds. We must have self-control. Do you have self-control within yourself? No. People get into a false sense of security saying, oh, I won't ever have a problem with that. Don't ever say, oh, I'm never going to have a problem with that. You need to be aware that temptation is always crouching at the door. The second that you let your guard down and say you're not going to have a problem with something is the second you've just given Satan free reign to show you just how weak you are. You must have self-control. Paul goes on to say, against such things there is no law, meaning that these are the signs that you exhibit that you are a follower of Christ. You should exhibit these signs. And we know by the way that I was saying at the very beginning is that I was said before, but I would always uh, question our kids when they were small, especially when you read your Bible today. They would say, yes. You know, great, that's good. Just let it go. Ask him the next day, have you been reading your Bible this week? Oh, yeah, Dad. We've been reading the Bible. Okay. Ask him the next week. Have you been, have, you know, y'all are getting an awful lot of arguments among yourselves. And you've been reading your Bible. Are you sure? Yeah, we, we've been reading that Bible. We've been doing it. That's funny because y'all's Bibles are locked up in our room. Oh, oops. <laughs> but not only because I knew I had their Bibles, because maybe they found another one, right? Maybe they didn't have to use those. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But the number one indicator 
that they weren't pursuing God's purpose in their lives and because their fruit was rotten. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit had nowhere to be found in their lives. Of course, I can point it back at me too. I'm the same way. If I'm not, if you're not seeing the fruit of the Spirit, then you pretty much can bet, bet that I'm not pursuing Christ's authority in my life by praying and reading the Bible and this kind of a thing. It's a good, it is an indicator of where somebody is. Can you say, well, do you know your neighbor Joe down the street? Jay goes to Whoopi on the Baptist again. I'm always not doing that. Jay goes to First Baptist Church down there. He seems to be a pretty good fellow. I mean, he goes to Sunday school. He goes uh, more Sunday morning. And, bonus, he even goes Sunday night. And he even goes Wednesday night. That's a lot of church going. Joe seems to be a good guy. I talk to him on the street. He's got a really nice fella. We kind of talk back and forth sometimes, you know, about the weather and about the this and that on the street. And who are we going to choose for trash pickup next week? I mean, you know, we, we have good conversations, me and Joe. He seems to have some of these qualities. He seems to be a pretty patient guy. He's pretty kind. Seems to be pretty faithful to his, to his spouse. I mean, I don't see a lot of debauchery going on over there, to use one of the dirty deep words. How can I really know though Joe's saved or not? He says he is. He got, well, he seems to be. He goes to church a lot. Carries a big, huge, intimidating looking Bible. So he seems to be a, a good fella. How do I know? You know what? I really don't know. And neither do you. We really don't know. There's one time I was a fella that was a missionary living with him. He had all the right notes. He had the right Bible. He went to church. He said all the right things. Seemed to be like he was pursuing God's direction in his life until he stole everything in the house and left. <laughs> what? I thought he was on the right track. Boy, was I wrong. That's an extreme situation. But it is an indicator nonetheless. We need to have discernment sometimes about where people are in their walk with God. If they're not exhibiting the fruit, you might just ask why. Is it that they're just kind of backsliding for a while? Or that they not really know the true God? You know, there's only two people that know you have truly accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and live for Him daily. And I'm talking Redemption, turn from your ways and live for him daily, which means you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. There's two people, one, you. Only you know if you've truly done that. And I'm not saying you've gone to church as a child and you've been baptized and you've got a Bible that you've marked up every now and then. It sits on the coffee table that you only open on Sundays. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's good. That's, that's a church attender. That's great. You may even be baptized. But I'm saying though, only you know if you have turned your life completely over to Jesus Christ. Only you know that. So you open the door right now to that question. Is that, well, have each one of us done that? If you haven't and you're not sure, then you need to make sure. Because the tornado's coming at 5 o'clock. There is a sense of urgency here that if you have not done that, you need to make sure you have done so. Once you've done so, fine. That's it. You don't have to redo your salvation every other Tuesday and Sunday. It's a one-time commitment to God. Does that mean you're going to be perfect your whole life? No, absolutely not. None of us are perfect. We're all going to have faults. We're all going to be on the, the good list and the naughty list here. Paul's all the time. But we repent. God forgives us. We move on. But that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. So only you know. If you have questions about that, about assurance of salvation, you can talk to me about it later. If you feel like you've never truly done that and you want to do that now, you can do that. If, you feel, if you've been baptized, like as a child, sometimes, a lot of times people baptize it very early on in their life, but they really didn't understand exactly what all that entailed. So later in life, they recommit. So you know, I just really, I really wanted to start living for God. And if you want to be baptized, we'll do it. We'll baptize you. Because that's what it means. New life. Baptism. Born again. This is what we do.
But you don't have to. I mean, if you're good with that, you know you've been bought by the blood of Christ. You're saved. There's no reason not to be baptized again. But if you have questions about that decision you've made, then it's certainly possible. There's nothing wrong with doing that. So you know whether you've truly given your heart over to Christ or not. And you're living for Him. So it's both. Second person that knows whether you've done that or not, it's God. You cannot fool God. You cannot mock God. You cannot pretend. Joe, my neighbor, can pretend all day long. You can go to the church. You can go to church on Wednesdays, which is a bonus. You can do all of those things and still not be living for God. You can do all the externals. You can even externally show all these fruits of the Spirit and still not know God. How do I know that's possible? Because I do know some good people in my life that aren't Christians. I know some people that say, you know, I just don't really believe the whole Christian thing. I just really don't believe the whole Jesus thing. But they are. They are. They do have love. They do have patience. They seem to have joy. They seem to exhibit kindness and goodness. But I think the key here is they seem to exhibit these things in their heart, though. There is going to be a hole. And there is not going to be true joy because they have not found the one that can give them everlasting joy, peace, happiness, fulfillment, all of those things. So we know as Christians that they're not okay. Even though they may seem to be okay and even though they might be nice people. This is why you must have conversations with people. Don't be afraid to offend them or whatever kind of scare tactic Satan wants to, to use in your life. <laughs> We must go to them and explain to them the process of salvation. All the more reason we need good people in God's family. Teach the fruits of the Spirit to your children and teach them early and teach them often. Because these are the kind of people they want to grow up to be. The people that exhibit these kinds of things. How do you teach patience to your children? There's a lot of different ways. First thing you can do is teach them you don't get to have everything you want right now. And then you probably need to turn around and tell yourself the same thing. It's probably one of the first lessons we need to teach children. You can't have everything you want right now. And there's a reason. Because it's not good for you. There's ways to teach all of these things. So if you always wonder what it is can I be working on with my kids, it's right here in the Bible. They gave you a list. Work on those things. Matthew 7 and 15, uh, verse 20, uh, basically summarize it for you. It says, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know who? You'll know believers by their fruit. You'll know people are dedicated to God by their fruit. It's a good indicator. And the opposite side of that is in Romans chapter 8. In summary, basically says, non-believers are enemies to God. You may think that seems to be a bit harsh, Paul. But... They have completely different life goals than you. You have to understand if someone is not living their life for Christ and they're not following God's will in their life, they're following their own will. If you're following your own will, you are an antithesis to God. You are a God. You're an enemy to God's will in your life. You are. That's why we need to get the word out. There is an urgency to all of this because Christ is coming back someday. We don't know when. There's an urgency because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's an urgency in your life. There's an urgency in your children's lives. There's an urgency in your neighbor down the street. There's an urgency everywhere that we need to work on this. And um, I guess probably you could look at society today and even say there's a greater urgency for children today. Because the things that children experience today are much more... Let's just say specific and directed towards them into the ways that they can get into a lot of things they shouldn't. There's a battle for our children's minds and hearts and souls now more than ever before, mainly because of technology. The child can have a cell phone and can find a lot of things right there on that cell phone that would not have been possible 30, 40, 50 years ago. The parent had more control over what the child saw and did. But now, it's right there in front of them. And unfortunately, 
even our school systems coming up. There's been some things that have changed over the past couple weeks. And even in our own school system, they're making sure that children have these choices that they need to have that are totally inconsistent with God's will and what the definition of sin is. You need to be aware of what is going into your minds and hearts of your children on their cell phones, when they go play at a person's house, at school, have the conversations with them about what they're seeing and doing, and then make sure you're teaching them the fruits of the Spirit. Let's pray.